So, chemical connections. The first word I had in there was bonds, and I thought, I'm going to attract the wrong audience today. Um, get too many financial people in. So, um, what is it about chemical connections that uh, I really want to talk about? Well, first of all, let's get the disclaimer out of the way. Uh, who knows? Uh, anybody's seen that before? Read, not to contradict nor confute, um, but basically to weigh and consider. What I'm going to tell you is what I believe. Uh, I haven't come to give a presentation. It's more of a structured rant, really. Um, <laughs> but I, I think hopefully provoke some thoughts. Who knows who's right and who's wrong? I don't. And I guess maybe at the end of this, we can have a discussion and uh, maybe agree on, on more than we disagree on. So, connections. Well, the Romans were making connections in 60 AD in North Yorkshire. They were mining alum uh, to fix dyes in textiles. They understood the value of supply chains and connections. And I'll bet some people in the room could tell me that was going on even before then. Um, so, what I'm going to tell you isn't new. Um, it's not rocket science either. Uh, and I guess uh, as we go through this, we just sort of build on this and it, it gets to a point where we start to understand some things we have to develop. And my theme is developing a very loud voice on. So, just think back to the Industrial Revol Revolution. I was going to get very obtuse and say, what's the connection between friends and this? And of course, the answer would have been, blah, all the young colleagues here would have got that one immediately. Some of my people my age wouldn't have understood the connection between friends and LeBlanc. He, he was one of the stars in the program. For them. But okay. Um, the point about this is, this, this was, the, I think it was sodium carbonate, uh, and it was the first industrial process. Uh, you know, in, in the Industrial Revolution, was it 17, I can't remember, 17, who could help me, 17, 70, 17, 80, I can't remember. But the point was, it actually underpinned many other industries. You know, the, the textile industry, the paper industry, the glass industry, the, the soap industry, all started to build on the back of the industrialization of, of, of chemistry, really. So we move on. We get to right up to, I would say, contemporary connections. What you have is, um, I'm sticking with, with organic because it's safe, because I know more about that. But basically, you know, from oil in the ground uh, through to large chemical complexes, um, and the knowledge at the time, go back to the Industrial Revolution, allowed us to mine, to extract materials. The knowledge at the time then allowed us to understand how to process them uh, and then to make other things. So we come, we come forward um, well over 150 years. This knowledge is about mining fossil fuels or extracting resources uh, and building large verbunds, that German word, where the, traditionally chemical plants were, were literally that. They were connected chemically. So I ran a nylon business, you know, so Cyclo was uh, reacted um, with, with um, DME, it was oxidized, wasn't it? So I'm thinking of Flixborough, uh, through to adipic acid uh, with nitric, through to um, H using HMD, and so on and so on. So one plant's product was another plant's um, uh, feedstock. That's how it worked for many, many years. But then we had globalization. And I think the UK um, didn't do as well as a lot of other countries. In the halcyon days, you know, it was great. It was growth. Uh, through two or three bad recessions, I've seen a, a, an overall decline in the, in the chemical industry. The idea of the jigsaw puzzle there is I can show you many sites where lots of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle have gone missing. Which in, and, and uh, if you, that actually is a real site that used to be a real chemical plant. I remember many, many years ago um, seeing a cartoon and it said two people wistfully looking over a gate saying, I remember a time, ah, yes, when this, this wonderful field used to be a chemical plant. Well, it's actually true now. You know, it, it really has happened. And so the, the, one, of the, one of the impacts of that is not only that some, some, some units have survived. Um, sadly, um, some, some haven't that should, that should have survived. But then energy pressures, you know, supply chain pressures, logistics pressures exist on the ones that are left because they become less competitive as a result of becoming uh, 
uh, part of a fragmented or dislocated supply chain. So you end up with significant efficiency losses, significant energy losses. And actually, if you can't sell to your next door neighbor, you're getting into exports, that's a whole different ball game as well, which we'll come on to. So the need to rebalance the economy, um, I think, is urgent. And it's about rebuilding supply chains, and I'm going to talk about that, um, to, to build, I think, uh, new engines for growth, uh, new, new products based on what I'm going to argue are new, new access to feedstocks. Just one point on this, uh, if, if you've got to spare four or five hours and you're just wondering what to do, go look at um, uh, the, off the statistics office and look at, look at the, the import and export figures. What you see is, um, I think, an increase in chemical imports of something like 10, 10 billion over 10 years. Assuming, of course, that that's because a lot of the businesses that I'm talking about went missing. So um, exporting is good, but avoiding importing is also good. So, so it's about how you build those supply chains back. And there's some real, real big numbers that are involved in, 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 the, in the decline of this industry we've got to try and put right. So this is how I see the world. Um, if you think of just the UK the, sorry, in, in, in its environmental or strategic context, what am I looking at? Um, in the middle is industrial policy or industrial growth, the thing that we're all interested in, the thing that creates jobs and gives value and hopefully improves the quality of life. So what impacts that? In our case, feedstocks logistics have a big, big impact, a big, big, big say in whether we're successful, yes or no. To the top. You know, markets and sectors and you know how close are we to advanced manufacturing to smart innovative customers uh, to competitive innovative um, uh, research question come back and talk about that on governance on regulation and legislation do we live in a positive environment or do we live in one that is can be improved and again we, we talk so, about that and how these things are connected and on this side, it is to do with the creation of knowledge and demography, what society thinks about all of this, um, you know, what public opinion is, because it, it's all in the mix. It all counts. Uh, I think ignoring any of this is, 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 it leaves you with a kind of a, a difficult uh, way to approach the, whole, the overall problem. So I'm going to start with feedstocks. Sorry, let me just, yeah, th this was the point about, I, I think it's, I've already made the point. Um, we, we've used knowledge in the past to create or extract natural resources. So this presentation now is about the creation of new knowledge, harnessing new technologies, new legislation, um, new creating new customers and new markets. That's the challenge we face, I think. So where do we start? So how do we get from a banana skin to a Coke bottle? I'm sure people in the room can help me understand that. Yes, Stanley can. I've gone about this a lot. Um, let me explain. That's a connection. There's billions of molecules there. When I was a kid, it was a, from Yorkshire, where there's muck, there's brass. It was true then, and it's true now. The bridge is kind of one of those corny things where you connect one side to the other, but never mind. It's a nice, nice picture of the, of the transporter bridge over the River Tees. So how do you connect a waste industry to a chemical industry? I think we've been a bit snooty about this. You know, we're, very, we're very clever, we're very bright. We don't, it's waste, it's not us. Somebody else's problem. Well, that was maybe in the past. I think we've got to start thinking about it in a very different way. Waste, waste of feedstocks. Does anybody know how much domestic waste we generate in the UK? Any, any idea? Yep, it's a lot. So half of that, roughly, oh, your eyes are better than I thought they would be, I have to say. <laughs> okay. So it's, if you add on top of that uh, industrial waste, it's huge. So it, half of that huge, typically is biomass. It's banana skins, it's, it's pork pies, it's sandwiches you throw away, it's, it's cardboard, it's paper, it's organic matter. 25% is, is mixed polymer from whatever, sandwich wrappers, you know, what, whatever, Coke bottles, whatever, whatever. It's a huge 
natural resource that we don't harness properly. So, and there it is. That just, he didn't believe me. It's, it's a lot of, I've done a lot of work on this with the Carbon Trust. And uh, we could go on and we could spend a whole evening on this, but I'm not going to. So, the market forces, remember, never lose sight of value. Market forces suggest a growing case for resource efficiency. Something else we haven't got time to talk about, but is very important for us, I think, is our, our image as an industry. And a lot of these things, I think, are, uh, uh, you know, one, one helps the other. If we become very resource efficient, if we start solving some, some, some of these world problems, including you know, the, the, the issues of plastic waste, then our image, uh, I think, it improves automatically. Actions do speak louder than words. So there is the market forces do suggest a growing case. Landfill right now is approaching it's 80, 90 euros a tonne. So um, it, is, it is far better for councils to find a way to move this at no cost to themselves. So this is feedstock coming at our industry potentially at um, uh, very, very low value. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail. I will spend a little bit of time on this. Um, this is where you might disagree with me, but I don't care. Um, let's just stick with polymers just for a minute. Remember I talked about landfill. I'm going to come back to biomass. Remember, that after having separated it all out. Um, the right thing to do with polymer is to mechanically recycle it. That's the best option. So there are already factories existing. There are two down here that uh, take polymer, HDPE, PET back to food grade in a mechanical process. That's good. Um, following that, um, there's not much between. There is some chemical um, reprocessing, but not a lot. Uh, and currently, legislation is, is helping drive towards um, energy from waste power stations, which I think are pretty, pretty bad, really. The reason is, first of all, um, you, you are unlocking the carbon that's in the polymer. So that's an issue for me. Uh, secondly, a lot of research done by, by Carbon Trust and others proves that the value of a molecule as a chemical molecule is more valuable than if it's converted to energy. Now, we can discuss that, we can argue about it, but I, I've not seen any, any evidence to su suggest that I'm wrong. So the value proposition then says chemical recycling uh, of that is, 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 is a smart idea. Therefore, back to the market op the opportunity. So I talked about that already. One of the, the issues, I, I've talked to people sort of in some of the breakouts about this, I'm going to come back and connect these things in a minute, is when we started to lose the, the chemical engineering, so the chemical plant connectivity, what started to happen was we, we ended up with a lot of low-grade heat that was just rejected through cooling towers. There was no use for it. Uh, and if you think then about um, what you would do with that, and th stop thinking about Verbunza's chemical processes linked, but think about linking anything to anything, you kind of get a different answer. Because the autoclaving process that actually processes waste requires exactly the kind of heat that, that is given up by places like Grangemouth and uh, the Northwest, the, the Northeast, the Humber, and so on. But equally, it's good for, for, you know, for AD, for paper mills, um, for different kinds of industry that are sort of low heat, uh, have a low heat requirement. It's a different kind of symbiosis. But actually, it's tremendously helpful in, in, in building back energy efficiency and resource efficiency. Very, very important then for... Um, rendering waste, the, you know, putting waste into uh, steam autoclaves um, at sort of 120 degrees at two bar, um, is, given that the heat is there virtually for free, um, essentially gives you metals and glass back to that industry, biomass, uh, you know, the bio is rendered to fiber, uh, which we'll come on to, that can go biofuels, biochemicals, biopower. We'll end with a value drill. And the polymer again, mechanically recycled or into uh, what I'm going to call depolymerization processes, and there are a number of them under development, to actually fully recycle um, the, uh, the, the polymers. So, graphite resources, plug for them, are one company that are doing this. This isn't a figment of my imagination, it's real. This is um, 
million ton a year unit up in Gateshead, uh, taking waste, putting it through a process, giving valuable feedstocks through the other end. It's about reconnecting that back into industry. That's the point. So, waste of biogas. Um, this is really a value drill, ultimately. I, I, I'm not going to argue where, where those molecules go, except to say, if it exists, if you've got, um, in, in any region, four or five million tons of gas, uh, I'm going to come on to unconventional fuels in a minute, then it's got to find a home. And so I'm arguing that um, if that gas is there, that's the way to simulate investments in either biofuels, and we talk about uh, methanol in a minute and bio-MTBE, or building uh, gas turbines just to make power, that's probably the short-term fix, or into chemicals. So, I mentioned depolymerization. This isn't a figment of my imagination either. That these processes exist. Um, I think the issue here, the challenge here, is, to, is one of scaling. We talked about um, you know, fundamental research, blue skies research, and I think that's, that's a, it's a wonderful thing we engage in. But I think there are times when we've got to really think about whether there's some game-changing solutions and whether we should be targeting research into specific areas. So the, the challenge here is to, is to get this to a scale which becomes industrially you know, sort of viable. Not, not, not there yet, but many, many universities, many, many institutions around the world are now working on these processes. I would say far more than in the UK. So Carbon Trust have done a lot of work on this. I'm not going to dwell on this too long. Uh, and this, I've already talked about you know, the various places this can go. This is just, again, a lot of work done just to kind of making the case for emissions of depolymerization rather than energy from waste to uh, power stations. Even correcting for grid. If you assume you've got to burn the gas to make the power. Even on a corrected uh, basis, it's still the right thing to do. So the value, there's a value driver there to, to do this. So... That was waste. And the point about that is waste is not competing with crops. Back to image and, and, and doing the right thing. And uh, th th those depolymerization processes were being worked on 25 years ago, at least. Um, I didn't realize how old I was until I saw that slide, by the way. The first one. I started work when I was 10. <laughs> um, so so the, the point about waste is that it doesn't compete necessarily with, with crops. For any of those, through any of those streams, and therefore I think can actually help the image of our industry. So let's talk, we're still sticking on feedstocks. Two other unconventional feedstocks, one you might have heard of, one you might not. Frac gas. Um, does anybody know how long the Americans have been developing their frac gas? 20 years. It's not new. What is new is the drilling technologies. The, 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 the new sort of um, directional drilling where you go horizontal um, is relatively new, sort of five, six, seven years old. So what you now see, if you took an aerial view um, of, uh, of some of the parts of America, you would see lots of holes where you know, 15 years ago, that's how it was. Now you see one hole that goes down and then is, is basically radial drilling at the seam. Very, very clever. So, American gas price from, what, 2006? I can't remember when it tripled. It, it tripled, uh, probably 2000, around about 2005, 2006. I can't remember exactly. It was over $13, $14. Uh, and if you look at the development of shale gas in that period between then and now, what you now see is gas selling 2 3 maybe $4. So, what did that do? Uh, in the US, I think it created in the shale gas industry 600,000 jobs. And there's now plans on the ground for about $2 trillion worth of investment, uh, up to 2035. Uh, and if I work on, you know, <coughs> Stan and I in Epic <coughs> often do multipliers, excuse me, <coughs> in terms of jobs in our industry and what do they, what do they create, if you were conservative and said four, maybe five, you get to some very, very big numbers in terms of employment on the back of what we do. So the wherewithal is there for us to do that. I'm going to explain how, how we can get there, I think. So, that, so that's, that's frac gas. Um, 
I'm going to come back to, I'm going to, come back to, uh, to coal gas in a minute. I'll show you something else. That's Poland. And a third of that landmass you will see is sectorized, and uh, you've got companies there like ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, and others who are now well into exploration to, to develop shale gas fields in Poland. Um, the rest of Europe um, is, is probably has not as much potential as this, but there's certainly potential in, in many other countries in Europe. Um, and I, I guess the, the concern I've got is that um, whilst the Americans are, are on and doing this, and, and I, I, I know that I think there are something like five steam crackers on the stocks now, um, given the, where the ethylene price is, because uh, America will compete um, you know, with the Middle East on, on ethylene inside 10 years. It just will. So, so the point about shale gas, and, and again, we haven't got time to, to spend <clears throat> talking about the environmental issues and all that. We can have a long debate about that, and um, I'm sure may, maybe in Q&A we can just touch on that. I just want to talk about coal gas. In the UK, we've got um, 3,000 million tonnes of coal. And it's in thin seams, so it's not the kind of stuff that you would go down and mine. Remember, we, we're, not, we're not going there again. But go back to the drilling technology. Go back to uh, uh, directional drilling. So this is now UGC. This is underground gasification of coal. And actually, similar technology up to a point. What you're actually making is syngas. 18% hydrogen, which we'll come back to. But again, syngas is the basic building block for doing almost anything. So if we develop that in itself, it would be bigger than the Qatari gas fields, which is interesting. So the other point I would make is, you think about where our industri the big manufacturing areas are in the northwest, the northeast, up in Scotland. Um, that's where the, 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 the resources were in the first place. So the fact that um, a lot of the coal goes out under the North Sea, and we have a, a network of pipes there, is kind of very helpful, you know, for the next generation of feedstocks. So that just, hopefully you'll sort of bear with that and just accept that it's there to go for. In this, on the same scale, if you consider Europe as, as, as you know, looking at anything close to, it, to, to, to the USA, then there is as much scope for Europe to develop its, its unconventional gas resources as, as the US. That's, that's, um, I think in Australia, there's, I think BG are investing 18 million in, in UGC already. There's, it's happening all over the world. So it's not new, that's not new either. So th this goes back to um, um, a slide I showed earlier. So the, 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 the top top there is around um, uh, waste treatment and if I, I would argue we need a national framework for the collection of waste and the synthesis of waste into useful uh, raw materials uh, and then a value proposition will decide whether that goes into um, power or fuels or chemicals like I said um, similarly I think you know um, th this was something I did for Teesside because it, it kind of struck me you, you, you build a lot, a lot more than chemical plants in Teesside, makes the chemical industry far more sustainable. Um, and the fact that you can give and, 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 and exchange heat is very, very, very powerful in this. And we're going to, I'm going to talk about sustainable resources and regulation in a minute. But it's about linking, this is starting to link some legislation and direction of travel into uh, positive legislation into, into how we can make this work. As it happens, Teesside's got one of the biggest hydrogen storage facilities in Europe. And so uh, we'll come back to that as well. I'm not here arguing um, for unconventional gas. I, I just make the point that it's there. there. Of course, there's a room for all of the sources of energy. And the point I would make is that I'm not encouraging or discouraging that really, but I would just say that um, if you looked at any of those sectors, I'm going to come make the point about high value manufacturing, a lot of chemicals, whether, you know, whatever form, but I'm thinking particularly in terms of polymers, advanced composites and plastics, find their way up into those sectors anyway. So whether it's a pull or whether it's a push, I don't care. 
so I, I'm not being kind of a, a dogmatic about this. I'm just saying it's, there isn't one size fits all back into to balance. I think it, it is about a balance. So, making connections. Um, I think it is about um, you know, working together. I mean, we can bash banks if we want to. I think we need our financial institutions. We need to understand a different appetite for risk. Uh, we need to find out how to engage them as opposed to, to beat them up. Um, engaging NGOs, um, government, UKTI, trade associations, media, really working together you know, uh, on, on, on what we can agree on rather than finding things that we disagree on. So, and it's about value. So um, in terms of linking knowledge, we talked about nano, we, it was interesting d listening to the, you know, the, two, uh, the, the two PhD students talking about uh, structures. Um, nano has been around a long time. Um, and I, I think we have, we, have, we have to be careful we don't end up with it looking like Frankenstein's monster. Um, I was at a seminar a while ago, he was in Paris, as it happens, and uh, this, this guy was telling me that he, he, he invented molecules he hadn't even thought of a use of, which is kind of interesting, but if you then start considering the implications of that statement, it's kind of worrying, um, uh, certainly for, 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 for people uh, in, in sort of political spheres who worry about these things. So one of the things that, um, do you want to just go back a minute? I think that uh, two examples of, of linking knowledge to, to solve problems. I'll come back to Nano in a minute. But how do I connect those images? Remember, that was the, uh, the UGC. Oh, that's a frac gas uh, well, actually. I've, I've got a picture off Google. So apologies to Google. That's an algae. So I'm connecting algae to, to frac gas because I knew what people were thinking. Some of you were anyway. He's an idiot. It's carbon. So that's already where algae is in terms of helping to solve the... This is about connecting knowledge and research to solving world problems. So we can all say, yeah, well, it's a problem, or we can get on and do something. That, that, th th these processes aren't particularly efficient, but they're there. And I was reading recently... Um, Enclosed photobioreactors, this, 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 this algae was spirulina, spirulina potentis, which is, as it says, it's an enclosed photobioreactor, and it was being argued that these things can get up to 70 80% efficiency. This converts carbon essentially to methane. Uh, so it doesn't have to go through the energy step that some do, whereby you're effectively extracting the algae and then beat, beating it up to, to, to pull the oils out. I make the point here as well, research into CO2 chemistry uh, is, is equally important. It's, not just, it's, it's all forms of chemistry to, to really address the carbon issue have to become a real priority. And then what I don't see is, I see, if I go, if you Google this stuff, it, it's amazing what's going on. Um, but then it's also amazing that it's not very well connected. I don't see it very well connected and targeted to... Uh, with funding and research in what is an absolutely crucial area for, for the planet. So there's a challenge. In, just in terms of value, um, back to legislation again. Uh, Teesside, I know, emits 10 million tonnes of carbon. That's everything. That's the, you know, the steel works, the chemical works, the power plants. And it's a fairly small area. It's a fairly you know, tight conurbation. I guess some people do know it very, very well. But if we get into set aside, and uh, let's say carbon goes to 30 euros a ton, that's putting, you can do the maths, you know, 300 million euros of tax into Brussels. So multiply that by the number of sites that exist. Th this, is, this is a you know, huge, huge issue. So um, on the one hand, if I could, A, avoid putting that 10 million tons into the atmosphere through some ring main, and I could equally then convert that carbon through some process, I'm imagining in 5, 10, 15 years' time, you know, I'm, I'm, this isn't going to happen tomorrow, then the methane is probably worth 300 million all by itself. That's 600 million of, of, of revenue either through tax avoidance or value created. That tells me that, subs, that, that kind of um, would, would justify a 3 to 4 to 5 billion pound 
investment. These, these are game changers. These are things that are there to do. So do we just you know, go ahead and say, well, let's go develop frack gas or coal gas and, and stuff the carbon? Or are we thinking about knowing where society wants to go, therefore where politicians want to go, and start working on the solutions that actually will help us to, to allow us to go do that and actually do some, some, some good with it rather than be arguing about the badness of, of what we are proposing. So that was just about closing the loop. What we have are open-ended uh, supply chains. In terms of carbon, it's possible through that to, to close the loop. And it's about working very, very hard and together on any processes that can, that can on, an, on an industrial scale, will do this because it's worth a lot of money. It's the right thing to do. It's an environmentally good thing to do, but it's also a, it's a good it's value to do as well. I talked about nano. Um, I, I, was, I was at a, the, who was at the launch of the International Year of Chemistry in UNESCO in Paris last year? Just me? Lucky me. Um, it was amazing. Um, four Nobel Prize. There was a day, there was a, there was a, there was a ladies day, which was very interesting. And um, it was about structures. I learned a lot about nano that day. That, that I, that's, I knew some, a little bit, but not a lot. And um, the story was that she, she'd actually invented the, um, uh, the lock, you know, in terms of the lock and key principle for, this was breast cancer, whereby you can construct molecules that lock on and avoid them spreading. And she, she had a paper clip. These are very small children, sort of 10, 12, 11, 12 years old. And she had a paper clip. She said, what's this? So a little girl says, it's a paper clip. So she, she straightens it. What is it now? It's not a paper clip. So what can you tell me? So one little boy said, ah, he said, well, that the, the structure has changed, but the composition's still the same. Said, Whoa. So this is young children getting all excited about nanotechnology. But then the next person that came on was talking about uh, nano and polymers. And, the, and he, she was working on, on, the sa on, on producing nanopolymers that would essentially allow disassociation of impurities from water at very low temperatures. Fascinating. She, she, again, a very, very eminent sort of uh, uh, chemist. So these are, for, in terms of world solutions, changing the image of science in the eyes of the world. I think there are, you know, a number of these that we should engage in, get connected on. And, and, and there are times to compete, there are times to collaborate. And I think there are, IP is a big problem, I know. We, again, we can talk about that. But there are things that we can do, work together on, that really solve some of these world problems and allow us then to develop feedstocks for, you know, for, the, for the future. This is, this is Skylon. Uh, anybody been in biz recently? Uh, lucky me again. There's a model of this. This is, this is British. Um, there's a model of this in biz. And what it does, it, these engines are basically hybrids. The, it's a, it's a jet, it's the nacelle, um, when it's on the ground, is open. So uh, it, it, fi it fires up on, on air, it uses hydrogen, back to where it was before. Uh, and it goes into, into space. The nacelle closes. It then fuels oxygen, behaves like a, a rocket, travels at Mach 6, goes to Australia in something like four hours. If I cut to the, to the chase. This thing's made of plastic. Uh, it's complicated. It's advanced materials. It's very, very clever advanced materials. So I'm saying to um, somebody in biz, wouldn't it be a shame if, if this British invention, all of the components of this, all of those molecules, actually came from somewhere else? It's about the supply chains. Now, remember, they're about the markets at the top. So it's about connecting industry, you know, base chemicals through converters into, you know, in, into uh, companies that, add, that actually make components so that the value is retained in the UK, connecting the top to the bottom and by having the, the, the framework to do that. And you can talk about you know, um, automotive. A uh, number of car companies, when, when you talk to them, say, where do your components come from? They come from outside the UK. Why? Because they're not made in the UK. The molecules probably are exported and come back as a component. 
So it's about understanding where that value is and how then we, we, we sort of start to build up growing the SME community um, to help us do that. But it's about, this is where UKTI and other organisations play a role, you know. We, we've, we've talked about this up in the North East a lot. It's about recognising where those real value propositions are and then put, getting the right people together, whether it's local government, national government, investors, the right kind of companies to come in and, and, and understand that, to start making those investments. But unless we make the case and we join together to make the case, it's going to be very, very difficult. And you see, for the, the reason I go on about Syngas is I could see that would be, I can't see as, you know, shouldn't close my mind to the possibility of flying an aeroplane that goes on, runs on batteries, but I could actually understand the concept of getting in this thing fueled on hydrogen, given that we have the wherewithal to, 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 to create, to, to, to make it and to store it in, in industry, on an industrial scale. But see, I, that's one example. I talk about all of those advanced uh, manufacturing supply chains. So, governments. Um, energy and environment and business. I, I think that, 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 you know, work well. I, I would just argue that it can be even better aligned and getting more consistent and more positive direction to help sort of in shape industrial policy. Um, I personally would ban landfill sooner rather than later because then that drives um, some of the things I was talking about before. It forces the, the, you know, the, the science, it forces the engineering, it forces that, that, that debate. That's positive. Um, I would argue set aside is actually, think about where the Americans are in terms of competitiveness driving gas price come down and what happened and what is happening compared to the European position of uh, increasing, especially increasing energy costs. It's kind of the wrong way around. So it's about how we help to that direction of travel and sort of getting out of the short-term problems and recognizing the long-term, that's where we've got to be. Uh, and it's about getting organizations, trade associations, uh, many organizations to work together with a loud voice to sort of talk about the long, long term and the value that can be there, but we, we, we've got to, we haven't got to die before we get there. That's, that's a big problem potentially. Um, okay, so what potential legislation to better decision making? This is, this is interesting. Um, oil seed rape, um, first jet, so processed biodiesel, fir, first generation biofuel. This is in, in, in the Netherlands, the glycerine or the glycerol. Um, is a waste. So therefore, you can call the bio-MTB, it's not quite bio-MTB, but you know what I mean, um, is second generation, therefore worth 60-70% more. So actually, it's easy. So when that's going into, um, as it turns out, it's significantly, I've got an, classic cars. Anybody got classic cars? Ethanol is not good for my car. So, but, but MTB is okay. So, um, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a modifier is a great idea. The problem that we've got, though, is we get caught by WID or by, by, you know, so by WID regulations. So in the UK, um, it's probably easier to call the glycerine a byproduct and deal with it that way than call it a waste and get caught by WID, even though um, you could end up with something more valuable than the stuff you're trying to make, actually. Crazy. So, so that's but one example of where legislation can change very simply. It doesn't cost an awful lot, but, but can really be, be very helpful in terms of sort of supporting uh, new industries uh, to, uh, to, to grow. So, getting close to the end. See the energy levels falling away now. My, 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 I, I would argue that the UK has a distinct, a unique offering. You know, we, have a, we are politically sta relatively politically stable. We're tremendous, our universities, you know, the, the, the institutions we've got are a tremendous source of knowledge for technology and innovation. I've argued, and I can show you lots of maps, I'm not going to bore you, that says we have tremendous access to natural resources, which I think should be developed over the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's about permitting, it's about planning, it's about all the, you know, addressing all the issues that we can all, all understand, but it's about getting on that journey. We have a lot of manufacturing expertise. We're really, really good at manufacturing, we are. 
Um, the infrastructure, which the UK is quite small, really, compared to lots of other places. I mean, Asia is huge logistically. So in terms of those supply chains I was talking about, it should be relatively easy to, sort of, to, you know, to, uh, to start connecting some of these things. I think we, we do understand that we've got a good relationship you know, in terms of working with, with uh, politicians and legislation. And that should build on that. It's about building bridges. This is about connections, not fighting each other. Um, I, I think you know, some countries have the political will for, for growth. I think the UK does. Um, some countries have political will for growth. I think the UK has that. The economic capacity, I think it's something that we, 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 we've also got. And this opportunity to link uh, chemicals to innovative customers you know, with global brand and global reach is, is how, you, how you do that. Um, based on value. I keep using that word. So, do we have a clear vision? A strategy for the industry that is about articulating the value we bring to society. Can we demonstrate that? Can we, can, can we show how that will work? How it connects? You know, and, and importantly, for me and for everybody, that is environmentally and economically sustainable. I, I think these two things just sit together so comfortably that, you know, that it shouldn't even be a question anymore in terms of the technologies that are, that are available to us. How well do we sell that message? Back to being connected and working as one to really work very, very hard to convince anybody that will listen uh, that, that, that that's how it is. That's how it can be. I think that this industry, as I've demonstrated, is and can be and is, has to be one of the cornerstones of a new industrial um, strategy. Every, anything that you can think of is, has molecules. You know, it, we, we would, you know, I've been playing with chemistry sets for 40 years. So, so that, that, that's an important point. We, the, the, for the UK to have a strong manufacturing base, has to have a strong chemical industry to support it. It is the industry of industries. I think I've heard that said before. So the job is to you know, do a lot of work, to get connected, like I've been saying all the way through this, to the doubters and the detractors, and articulate that value and that vision, and show how we overcome those problems. Uh, to the many stakeholders, uh, we need to make those connections. So with that, um, I've got one final comment. Any quality gurus among, in the audience? Lucky me. <laughs> Deming. Deming said, survival is not compulsory. Do you know something? It's absolutely right. It isn't, it, we, can, we can either wish for this to happen or we can, we can roll our sleeves up uh, and we can, we can make it happen. I prefer um, the latter there. The choice is ours. So thank you very much for listening.